tonight. And um, as we get back into our, our study of the, of the rapture, and like I said before, it's encouraging to me. Uh, I've been recording these on video and uh, posting uh, each lesson on the, on the internet. Um, and you can actually find them at Google Video is where we're posting them to. And um, so if you go to Google Video and type in Michael Hoggard Rapture Bethel Church, uh, you'll see all of those videos there. And um, so, and people are watching it. And I, I leave on there that they can request a copy of the DVD. And I've had several requests so far. And uh, I'm encouraged by that. And uh, it's been a good study. And it's, and it's kind of provoked me to, to get back into studying some things I haven't studied in a long time. But uh, I want to just kind of take it. And the Lord's taken this thing far beyond. I've got notes that I wrote down about four weeks ago when I was preparing this stuff that I haven't even got to yet. Uh, the Lord just kind of has us going down a rabbit trail. Uh, take your Bible, turn to uh, 2 Kings, if you would. 2 Kings, and we're going to revisit something just briefly. Something that uh, we, we talked about, not the last lesson, but the lesson before that. Um, we talked about Elijah going up into heaven without dying. And he did so in a, in a very particular way. And we're going we're gonna to touch on this very briefly and then we're going to look at the biblical significance of, of what God's trying to teach us here. And in the process, I'm going to teach you to speak a language, okay? I'm going to teach you to speak a new language tonight. And uh, no, I'm not going to give you the gift of tongues. But uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to teach you something from the Word of God that will hopefully be a blessing to you uh, tonight. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, last, last time we met on this subject, last time we talked about this, God led us over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we could clearly see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we could clearly see in that, that it looks like that there is something that happens before the rapture of the church. And that is the great falling away, what we call the great falling away, the great apostasy. For that day shall not come, Paul said, until there come a falling away first. He said that falling away takes place before that day happens. That's interesting. Amen? Because that's not how I grew up. That's not how I was taught. I was taught that the rapture happens and then everybody falls away because all the saints are gone and this and that and the other. But the way I read that, the way I see it there, the way, the way it's written is that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And I'm not going to go and revisit all that tonight. But it's going to tie in with some things that I'm going to share with you tonight. And, and probably the next time we get together and do this. It's going to tie into some things. And, and let me just kind of tell you where we're going tonight. Back several years ago. And somebody gave me a copy of this book. Which is a bad idea. Don't ever loan me a book. Okay. Do not ever loan me a book. A cassette. A video. A CD. Nothing. Don't loan it to me. You either buy me a copy or give me yours. Because I'm not going to give it back. Okay, I'm not, you can just ask anybody that knows me, they'll tell you, don't do that, okay? But anyway, he, he uh, somebody loaned me a copy of Tim LaHaye's Left Behind book. And, and, and at that time, I, God did, had not called me into this ministry of Bible prophecy, and I was trying to read it, and I just, I don't know, for some reason couldn't really get into it. But let me just kind of lay out the scenario that Tim LaHaye and, and, and uh, uh, what's this guy, Jenkins, lays out for you in this whole series of left behind books is that that it all starts with the rapture of the church and then after that it chronicles the life I guess of, of a man or, or a group of people throughout these series that are what are what is called tribulation saints and it shows how they kind of survived and how they had to hide and and I'll even say this in one of those books I think it was called the mark it actually says in there that one guy received the mark of the beast against his will. And it was said in that book that it's okay, he's still going to go to heaven. Uh-uh. That's not true. And, and when I read that, I read that, I read an article on the internet about that and I couldn't believe it. And uh, it had a link to, at the time, uh, uh, I think his name's Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye had like a, um, oh, had like a, an internet site where you could leave feedback about the book and ask questions and the authors would write back. 
And someone asked him, did, did you really mean to put in there that you can receive the mark against your will and still go to heaven? And the authors replied, yes, absolutely. That's, you know, God looks on the inside, not on the outside of you. That is contradictory to the word of God, my friend. And I want to tell you something. It, it is, to me, uh, and maybe, maybe his intentions were not harmful in any way, but I want to tell you something. It left the impression, and, and a lot of, lot of lost people read these books. A lot of lost people read these books. Into the millions of people read these books. And the truth of it is, it left an impression in the minds of these people that if, that when the rapture occurs, they still will have another chance to live for God and do right and go to heaven and survive and all this stuff, and they'll still be saved, even, even, if they're drugged and taken and, and they have a mark put on them, that they can still go to heaven. I want to tell you something, that's a lie, and I smell a devil in that, don't you? I want to tell you something, one of, the Jeho one of the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, if I get this right, is that when you die, you lay in the ground until the final judgment, and then when you go stand before God, God will give you one more chance now. That may not be that, it may not be Worldwide Church of God or something like that, but they taught that, that you'll lay in the ground until judgment day, and then God will call you up, and then he'll give you one more chance to acknowledge him as Lord, and then if you do that, then he'll let you into whatever kingdom you belong into. I want to tell you something. That, see, as a, law, as a sinner, that appeals to me. Amen? As a sinner, that appeals to me. What, and what that does is, that uh, just kind of gets me to think, well, you know what, then I can live how I want to and do what I want to and drink my, drink my beer and take my drugs and chase my women and do whatever I want to do and do whatever I feel like doing. And uh, when I die, God's going to give me one more chance to get it all right. Well, shoot, I'm such a, what is a procrastinator that that's, how, that's the path that I'm going to follow if I believe that. But I'm going to tell you something. You're being given a chance right now. The Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Amen? Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation the Bible says. And so what I'm telling you tonight is, is that you are living and breathing God's air right now. Then you need to get saved before you die and go to hell for all eternity. Amen? You need to do it today while you've got a chance. And don't buy into this thing because I'm not so sure. I'm just, in fact, I'm, I'm reading some things in the scriptures, folks, associated with what I, I believe associated with the rapture. And I'm telling you that if you think that you're going to wait for all, all the good church people to scoot out of here, and then you'll wake up and start living right, I don't think so. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11 says, concerning that falling away... God says, for God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And if you're still here, when the saints are gone, I would say that you're probably going to believe a strong delusion and believe a lie in the last days. Can I hear you say amen? So you know what I'm telling you? Get things right with God today while it is still today. Amen? Alright, 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 1, and it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a what? A whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. I'll never forget the weekend that God just literally opened up the floodgate in my mind of, of what I called then, and I, I guess I still call it now, the, the apocalyptic language structure of the King James Bible. God began to show me how words and phrases being used in the New Testament, if you would go to look at them in the Old Testament, you would begin to, God would begin to fill you with, with knowledge and understanding. That if you started seeing, if you saw, if you saw a stone, in the New Testament, and you saw a stone in the Old Testament, it's referring to, guess who? Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. If you saw a lamb in the New Testament, and you saw a lamb in the Old Testament, guess what you're doing? You're looking at, and, and the language structure is, is amazing in that I, I believe the simplicity of Christ. Now I believe that you don't have to be a Greek and Hebrew scholar to understand what God's got to say in this book, amen? In fact, and I have a teaching on this on, on the King James Bible and I can show you from scriptures that this Bible is actually a fulfillment of the gift of interpretation of languages. 
It is the three languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And one interprets those, all three of those languages. We have one language structure throughout this entire thing. So we see phrases like lamb and stone and, and woman and things like that. Key phrases all throughout the scriptures. Uh, and we see here whirlwind. We see a whirlwind given here. And so the, the God, God just sort of wanted you to know some things that would be associated with the translation of the Gentile church in the last days. So I'm just going to take you on some verses tonight. And we're going to see how God is, is we're going to talk about the whirlwind rapture. That's hard, I almost said the whirlwind rapture. This is Elmer Fudd prophecy time. The whirlwind rapture, or Baba Walters. Alright? No, I won't act like Barbara Walters, amen? Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. Did you bring your Bibles tonight? Say Amen. See, you're, you're, if you didn't bring your Bible tonight, then you're saying, Brother Mike, you can go ahead and lie to me and it'd be all right. Okay? No, you bring your Bible. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 14. Look at what the Bible says. Okay? Uh, I, I want us to... Uh, oh my goodness. Boy, I could talk a lot about, about Zechariah chapter 9. Um, look, if it, well, look at verse 9. You'll see that it's a, a prophecy of the coming of the Lord. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. That was partially fulfilled when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Will be perfectly fulfilled. Revelation 19, when he comes down riding on a white horse. Are you ready for that? Say amen. Okay? So this is a prophecy concerning the, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then he says in verse 14, And the Lord shall be seen over them. The Bible says, Every eye shall see him on that day. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the what? The trumpet. What did Peter or Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He said, At the last trump, these things are going to take place. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And so then he, he says here, the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. So we are looking at something when Elijah was taken up into heaven by this chariot and this whirlwind, God is showing us things to come, how it's going to happen. And he's associating it here with the trumpet and with the coming of the Lord. Now I'd like for you to take your Bible. We're going to go backwards and turn to the book of Amos chapter 1. The book of Amos chapter 1. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. If you find any of those books there, just kind of trace the path. Amos chapter 1. Mm -mm -mm. This is one of those, uh, what's well, an interesting passage here we have in Amos. God says about eight times here, uh, for three transgressions and for four, for three transgressions and for four. And if you just, if you just want to see what God's going to do in these last days, boy, he's going he's to turn it loose. And then he says in Amos chapter 1 verse 14, well, let's back up to verse 13. Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of the children of Ammon. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped, look, oh look at this, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead. You know what that is? It's abortion. It's abortion. I think that's murder. Amen? Amen? I think abortion's murder. You say, well, you don't know that. Yeah, I do. I read it in the Bible. The Bible says John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. From his mother's womb. Meaning that God knew that he was alive in there. Amen? God knew that he was alive in there. And the, the wickedness, the wickedness of the children of Ammon is, and God's going to punish them for it, is that they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead. And they might, that they might enlarge their border. You know what the biggest, you know what the biggest number one reason why these liberals say they support abortion? 
they say, well, this country's too overcrowded anyway. And if we just, if we just do away with these tissue samples that are in these mother's wombs, that'll leave room for the rest of it. How sick that is. It's very selfish. It's murder. Verse 14, God said, But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof with what? Shouting. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You see it? Connection here. With shouting. That's the language structure. That's the language that I'm teaching you. The new language of the apocalyptic language in the King James Bible. When you see people shouting in the Old Testament. You see a shout taking place at the rapture. There's a connection here. I'm probably going to teach this next time if we get, if we get there quick enough tonight. Which I'm not sure that we will. But I'm telling you, you remember when they marched around Jericho 13 times. They blew trumpets and they shouted. The Bible's trying to tell you something. What the translation, what the rapture is associated with. So he says here, But I will kindle the fire in the wall of Rabbin, and shall devour the palaces thereof with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest. And God actually names the day. That it's going to take place. He calls it, underline this in your Bible, the day of the whirlwind. The day of the whirlwind. A whirlwind is associated, we're going to see it here, move on. We're going to see it associated with God's judgment. Okay? By the way, Hurricane Katrina was, guess what? God's not going to be mocked, is he? A whirlwind. Wind. Okay? And you say, well, I don't believe that God did that. Who did then? Mother nature? Amen? Your mother in law? Amen? God's the one that controls the wind. Amen? And you know what? You know, two chapters in the Bible, when God finally speaks to Job, you know what the Bible says? God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. Okay? And by the way, I, and let me just get into this tonight. And, and I don't have time to explain it. But you know how a whirlwind looks, right? That, that sort of spiral pattern. Looks like when you let the water out of your bathtub or when you flush the toilet, right? Has anybody ever seen a spiral galaxy? A picture of a spiral galaxy? Looks same thing, doesn't it? Okay? There's actually a mathematical pattern that it follows all creation in one way or the other, follows this same pattern. It's, it's called the Fibonacci pattern or the golden ratio. Now, I have time to explain it tonight. But it's interesting that the Bible says that God spoke out of the whirlwind and it follows that same mathematical pattern. And God designed the cochlea of your ear to look exactly like that. It follows the same mathematical pattern so that when God speaks... You'll hear. Amen? Because they match. Amen? So it's kind of th I, that was free. You don't have to pay for that tonight, all right? I threw that in there for free. Now I'll take your Bible, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Here's what we're going to get is some scary stuff here, okay? Basically, I just spent a couple verses showing you that the whirlwind in other places of the Bible was associated with the rapture, the shouting, and the trumpets, and the judgment of God, and so on. Now I'm going to show you something else. Might sober you up a little bit. Might let you know that when this day of the Lord takes place, God's going to be serious about it. God's going to be serious about it. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that right now that God hears your prayers while you're alive on this earth? Amen? Okay? If you're not saved and you die and you stand before God, Will you be able to plead with God for mercy? There will come a time when God won't listen. Amen? Woe to anybody sitting here that ever gets to a place in their life where God ain't going to listen anymore. And I can show you, I listen, you're looking at a guy who believes in prayer. I believe in prayer. 
I believe that God hears prayer. But I can take you to places and show you that at some point God stops his ears and he won't hear anymore. One of these is in the book of Proverbs chapter 1. Are you there? Say amen. Look at verse 24. In fact, in fact let's, let's back up to 20. Let's back up to verse 20 so we get the context here. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 20. Wisdom crieth out, she uttereth her voice in the streets. Oh my goodness, wisdom is crying out to us tonight. She is, she is begging us to listen, to give heed to her. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. God is pleading with his people. God is pleading with church members all over this country. Turn, turn your heart toward me. Listen to my word. Don't listen to the rock and roll show that you had in church service. Don't listen to the purpose-driven life books and all the self-help stuff that you've been feeding your mind on. Don't listen to that stuff. Give heed to my word. God said, if you do, I'll pour out my spirit upon you and, and, and you'll know. People say, oh, I don't read that King James. Can't understand it. You know why you can't understand it? You ain't got no spirit in you. Amen? You ain't got no spirit in you. Verse 24. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. God said, God said, I will also laugh at your calamity and will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. The whirlwind, the rapture, an event that takes place on earth where all eyes are going to see Jesus appearing in the clouds. Even those whom pierced him, Israel, they're going to see him in the clouds. will be caught up like Elijah. The day of the whirlwind takes place. That whirlwind marking the judgment on planet earth. And people say, well, when that happens, then I'll be one of those tribulation saints. I won't take the mark. I won't do that. I won't give in to the new world order. Me and my stash of guns in my bunker that I built are going to weather it out till Jesus comes. What they say. They're looking for us to leave as a sign for them. Well, now I'll pray and ask God to forgive me of my sins. I'm telling you, this is what I'm reading here. And I know, I know there might be some that watch this get mad at me because it messes their eschatology. But, but I'm just telling you, consistently throughout the scripture, there has always been... A time when God said, enough. God said, enough. No more. You pray, I'm not listening. Do you know why? Because I called and you didn't answer. I... I stretched out my hand to help you. My right hand of salvation. I bent down and I set, I set my hand. Jesus Christ. I set my hand down to lift you up. And you wouldn't take it. So now, my, world, my day of whirlwind has come. 
And you're calling unto me. And I want to tell you something. God not only doesn't hear them. He laughs at them. Moms and dads, you know what that's like, right? The two-year-old is trying to put his shirt on. And you want to help him. Amen? And you reach out your hand to help the two-year-old put his shirt on. And he doesn't want your help. So five minutes later when he shows up with his arm tied around behind his back... Through the head hole. What do you do? You laugh at his calamity. Amen. Because <laughs> it's funny. I tried to help. Yeah. And you take a picture. And take it to grandma. Okay. In a far more serious way. God said I'm going to laugh at your calamity. Because I called and you didn't answer. And I stretched out my... I gave you my only begotten son. And he poured his blood all over the ground for you. And you didn't whine. So guess what? You're not getting it. But there's a message I could leave with anybody who listens to this. Don't wait. Don't wait. young man 40 years old I did his wedding and he didn't listen don't wait sounds like to me that when the whirlwind takes place God quits hearing prayers I, and, and now let me qualify that by saying this. I believe that God stops hearing Gentile prayers. Because I do not believe for a minute that God's going to turn his back on it. Especially, in fact, that's the day of the restoration of Israel. And I can prove that to you by going back to 2 Kings. Because when Elijah was picked up by the whirlwind, what happened? Elisha, who represents Israel received a double portion of the Holy Spirit of God, didn't he? Okay, he received a double portion. And, and, I, and I'll just say this tonight too, and, I, and I'm wrestling with, these, with this verse. Second Thessalonians has a verse and it says, Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. And everybody says, well, of course, we all know what that means. That means that's the day when God pulls the Holy Spirit off the earth. I haven't found that in the Bible yet. I have not found the prophecy where God said he was going to withdraw his Holy Spirit off of planet earth. He takes it off people, certain people, but he does not withdraw it. In fact, he pours it out upon Israel in those days. And the eschatologists, they say, well, you know, you know people, they, they won't, they, they'll be getting saved without the Holy Spirit. I don't, how do you do that? How, did you get saved without the Holy Spirit? In fact, it was the Holy Spirit that drug you kicking and screaming. Amen? I don't know. I'm just saying, guys. I'm just saying. The books ain't got it all figured out, but God does. Amen? And I say, get your heart right with God now. Get it right with God now. Oh, let's see here. Isaiah. No, 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 no. Let's see here. Take your Bible. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. If you want to jot another verse down, Isaiah 66, 15 talks about chariots and the whirlwind. You guys are making fun of me tonight. It's going to make me cry. Yeah. Yeah, why? I don't think that's funny. Oh. Don't you just mix, miss Bugs Bunny? Amen. Waskily wabbit. Jeremiah 23, are you there? Say amen. We'll get there. Now it's my turn to laugh at your calamity. Isaiah 66, 15, the Lord cometh with chariots like a whirlwind. Okay, just kind of look at that verse. 
And then Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 19. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. I, I, don't have, I don't have enough time tonight, and I guess that's the Lord, uh, because I would spend a lot of time on this, and I will probably, um, I have it in my, my heart and my mind to do a follow-up video, at least one video, maybe two, on the emerging church and what's going on. Uh, because I'm telling you, guys are walking away from the Bible like crazy. I had a lady from Bloomington, Illinois, give me a call. And um, she said, I wish, I wish I lived in Festus. She said, my pastor has been doing, content he said he practices contemplative prayer, which is basically yoga meditation. And in that yoga meditation, you claim that you hear the voice of God. Now, I want to tell you something. That is drunkenness. And when you're drunk, you don't hear God's voice. You hear a different spirit. So her past, and, and, and I could name the, well, I will. It's the Assembly of God pastor. And I'm not knocking denomination. I'm just saying that's who he was. You'd think this guy would be a straight arrow. But he's not. He's practicing a form of trance yoga meditation, calling it prayer. And he's hearing from false spirits. You know what I told that lady? I told her, get out of that church. I'm not, jo I'm not playing around anymore. I'm, I'm serious as death on this stuff. We got, we got pastors that are going into trance yoga states that are hearing from false spirits and are standing behind a pulpit. We're supposed to trust them? Uh-uh, not on your life. And I'm not going to recommend that anybody do that. Nobody. The spirits come out, boy, listen to this man. The spirits come out of the bottle. Amen? I, I'm, just, I'm just saying to us, we're, we're just, we're, we're long overdue. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 19. The Bible said, Behold, a whirlwind, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in niceness, no, in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. He said, in the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. Perfectly, I believe that God is going to open up the revelation of these Old Testament prophecies to God's people. And they're going to see this thing and they're going to know this is that which was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. They're going to know it. Verse 21, I have not sent these prophets... Yet they ran. I have not spoken to them. Yet they prophesied. That's what you hear. Everybody say, oh, we got, a new, we got a new revelation from God. We got a new revelation about Jesus. We're going to transform the church. We're going to change what Christianity means. We're going to change what the Bible means. They're, they're, they used to do it in secret and in closets and in seminaries. Now they're doing it openly in their magazines and in their websites and in their teachings and preachings. They're saying, we are going to revolutionize Christianity. We're going to change what it means. We're going to change what people thought about the Bible is what they're saying. They're saying, God's telling us to do this. And God said, I didn't send them. They said, we're hearing from God. And God said, I didn't say nothing to them. Hmm. Verse 22. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way. That's what preaching's supposed to be, folks. Real preaching is supposed to turn wicked people from wicked ways. Not turn them to it. Not tell them it's okay to listen to ACDC and play their music in church. Amen? I shouldn't ought to preach this tonight. But I'm just, I just want you to look at it. Verse 23, God says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said. That prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Which think to cause my people to forget my name. So you know what's coming out of these churches now? God's called by different names. People worship the same God, just different names. Robert Schuler is holding a conference right now. And proclaiming that message. 
He's, he's had, this guy's had New Agers on his, behind his pulpit. He's, he's had Muslim clerics telling them that he thinks it's great that they all worship the same God. And Rick Warren is a huge follower of Robert Schuller. Verse 27 again, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for who? Baal. The prophet that hath the dream. You know what he's saying? He's saying that everybody thought, that the prophets and the priests convinced everybody they were still worshiping the Old Testament God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he just, he has a new name now, it's Baal. Verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word. How? Faithfully means don't back down, guys. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire? Mm, 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 mm. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You know what that means? He's going to baptize you with the Bible. You say, you say, I'm not sure about that. Jesus, uh, Paul said in Ephesians that Christ washes his bride with the water with his word. The Bible is a baptizing fire. How many of you need chaff burn off of you? Say amen. Mm -mm -mm. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Come on. Oh, we don't use the King James anymore. We've got sophisticated. In fact, you don't even, at our church, you don't even have to bring a Bible. Because we're not going to use it right anyway. I'm going to tell you something. I, I really shouldn't have preached this tonight. I, my heart's been broken this week since that lady called me. You know what it was? Her pastor was trying to get her to sign a church oath. And I said, don't do it, it's bondage. And she listened to me and I told her, I was sent, we sent videos out today, didn't we Rose? We sent videos to her today. She said she'd like to join our church. She's trying to convince herself that Bloomington, Illinois is not that far from here. And I want to tell you something. The the. The name, the number of pastors, and I just, I, I better get off of that. God said, I'm against the prophets. Verse 30 again, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They've replaced the Bible with New Age philosophies. They're teaching, you know what they're doing now? They're teaching movies, movies that come out. These churches jump on the bandwagon of some new movie like McDonald's with Happy Meal toys. They'll jump on the... They got a Spider-Man 3 Bible study. I kid you not. One, one church... And, and it's not just one church. It's a whole bunch of churches because this, this marketing material is coming down from these big publishing houses. And I can't remember the name of the movie. But the, the, they, were, they were saying how you could find God through this movie. And the movie, I can't remember the name of it, featured this guy with two basketballs and he was holding them right in front of himself like that. And it obvious, and that was their marketing material. God said he's against them that stole the word from their neighbors. Verse 32. No, verse 31. Behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that used their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies. That's that, that's that charismatic, charismatic neo-Pentecostal crowd that says they dream the dream. I'm having tongue-tied tonight, ain't I? That's that neo-Pentecostal charismatic crowd. This old oh God gave me a vision. Old oh God gave me a dream. Oh, I got a word of knowledge. I got a word of this. I got a word of that. And they're not quoting the Bible. They're not reading the Bible. I saw a video today of one preacher that said that God told him that he was that he was going to prophesy in Montana, 
And at that time there was a bunch of wildfires spread all over the, the, the place up there. And that he was supposed to get up on a mountain and prophesy there. And it would snow and put all those fires out. And on the way from the airport, he was riding with a pastor and said, God gave me confirmation that, and God gave me confirmation and the pastor said, what verse is it? And the pastor said, it's not in the Bible. God said it's going to be in a fortune cookie at that Chinese restaurant we go to. And he showed everybody the fortune cookie. You would, th this, you would think people would go, you're, you're an idiot. That generation that follows that junk, the Bible says that's the one that are pawing and naming after their neighbor's wife. Like a horse. <laughs> Come here. Verse 32 again. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And when this people, let's see how far I'm going to read tonight. I'm almost done. And when this people or the prophet or a priest shall ask thee, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Thou shalt then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, saith the Lord. God said, I'm not telling them nothing. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man in his house. Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What hath the Lord answered? And what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. For every man's word shall be his burden. For you have perverted the words of the living God. And that word perverted means exactly how it's being used. I, I saw a deal today. A church is doing a four week series on sex. Here, it's another church doing a preaching series on sex. And they advertise in it. They sent out mailers to hundred some odd thousand people in that area. Maybe that wasn't that much. But the advertisement, the postcard was four weeks of sex. Come to our church. So that's perverting the word of God. Amen. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. For you have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee? And what hath the Lord spoken? But since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, Ye shall not say the burden of the Lord, Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you. In the city that I gave you and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. All of that associated with the whirlwind. So I believe... And you can see it from these scriptures here. The falling away. You can see the falling away right here, can't you? So I believe the falling away takes place first. And then the whirlwind comes. Does that make sense to everybody? So what I'm saying to you tonight, and I'm going to try to say this as plainly as I can. Without tying my tongue around my teeth. Get your heart right with God tonight who said you had tomorrow who said you had a trip home to think about it it was by the grace of God that you woke up and breathed air this morning and that, that has set home with me this week it is by the grace of God that you were able to get out of bed and walk on God's earth how dare you flaunt your sin in front of a holy God with him giving you the opportunity to repent and you just flaunt it in front of God like it's nothing and say, well, I'll be around tomorrow when I'm done. God have mercy on your soul. Amen. God have mercy on us all. Amen. I'm not, and listen, I'm not just preaching to you guys. I'm, I'm starting here first and moving my way down. And I'm just saying to us tonight, number one, we're going to hold steadfast. It's either going to come from the word of God out of this pulpit or it ain't coming. Period. And number two, Let's make sure we're right with God. Can I hear God's people say amen?